A little word of ex explanation as I uh, launch into this this morning. Uh, two weeks ago, I began to talk about, and, and um, I've been, as I've been traveling this year, I've been sharing some very specific things. I began to talk about what I've been sharing out on the road two weeks ago here, and uh, really talking about the burden of the Lord that leads to travail. Uh, that's a divine order issue, actually. And then unto uh, God's full purpose, his full intention. Uh, normally, when I'm out on the road, uh, Larry can tell you the same thing. We'll have three, four, five times to share. I'm condensing this into two. So, um, and actually, what I'm going to share this morning is a little different from uh, anything I've sh had an opportunity yet to share out on the road. So, but uh, uh, really, uh, over a year ago, the Lord began to um, speak to my heart some very uh, specific things and to uh, just use this word to commission me specifically to talk about um, particularly the Lamb of God. And uh, as that has progressed over the past year or so, uh, and uh, just my heart to be faithful to the Lord. Um, I've waited for some years, really, to begin to talk about the Lamb that uh, Jesus is and that nature, the Lamb nature that is the nature of the eternal Godhead. Um, I'm adding to that as I go along here other things that the Lord has been showing me and speaking to me, particularly revolving around the bride of the Lamb and uh, this issue of recovery. We are, uh, this is just obvious, I think, to any of us who have been in the body of Christ for some time, or perhaps if you're new in the body of Christ, we need recovery. We need uh, to see the Lord, um, being specific, reestablish his name among a people. Amen. We need uh, the bride to emerge. Uh, the coming forth of the bride is in direct correlation to the return of the Lord. You can see that clearly in Revelation 19. The bride making herself ready brings the Lord out. That's why uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12 says, looking for and hastening the coming of the Lord. The only way that can happen is for the bride to make herself ready. It is in Revelation 19. It is coins, it is not in, in, in just a coincidence. It is specific there. The bride making herself ready causes the coming of the Lord. We're in a time to where the Lord is having we, his people, to refocus our hearts, our attention upon him as lamb and the lamb's eternal desire to have a bride. Uh, I've had the Lord say some things to me that I have uh, had never heard him say specifically using the word historical significance. Um, I've heard that three times from the Lord in the past year or so. Uh, out of the other so many years, never heard him use that type of language. Uh, I'm just saying this to us. We're, we are in historical times. And we must understand the time that we are in. Specifically, though, not just generally. Uh, we need to understand it in the eternal purpose or the eternal scheme of things. And we need to understand it within this generation. So uh, that's kind of laying the background for what I'm going to share. There's a lot of scripture that I want to read from this morning. I uh, probably won't get to all of it. Uh, I'm sure that I won't. But let's begin in the book of Genesis, um, chapter 2. And uh, let's start with verse 20. We'll read through the rest of this chapter and then look at some other fragments of scripture as we work our way through this today. This is an incredibly exciting time to be in the Lord. And it's uh, just to, uh, I've been saying this, I'll say it again, 
it will be a time, it will prove to be a time of uh, <clears throat> a great adversity. Confrontational adversity actually is the right word in there. There is confrontational adversity that uh, we have begun to be in. We're going to be in it more and more. The purpose of God in that, not just allowing it but causing it actually, is for spiritual awakening for his people. It's actually threefold. Spiritual awakening, spiritual hunger and desire to be increased, and spiritual enlargement. Those three things are the purpose of God's confrontational adversity. So what we must understand that as we move in to the days we're in and further ahead, as that increases, uh, as the discipline of the Lord increases, um, we have to understand less condemnation get in on our hearts, uh, and it's easy to do so, to where we have an accusatory question towards the Lord of why question. We have to understand God's purposes in adversity, God's purpose in confrontation. It is to bring greater spiritual awakening, greater spiritual hunger and desire, greater spiritual enlargement to us. Those are all uh, wonderful dynamics if we will yield. So the shaking has a purpose, doesn't it? Anybody experienced shaking over the past few years? How many have experienced financial shaking over the past few years? And, well, just say this. This goes without saying. Our nation has a problem with money. We love it too much. I know that went down like a rat sandwich, but I don't really care. <laughs> Listen, not, not that money's evil. That's not the issue. But our nation is caught up with the God of pleasure, and the God of entertainment, and the God of money. And so to get our attention, the Lord is shaking structures. Are we okay with that? His purpose is not to harm. His purpose is to awaken. His purpose is to create a greater hunger and desire in our hearts for him himself and to cause a spiritual enlargement to occur within his people. I want that. How about you? So it's all how we perceive things. Uh, and, you know, we can either blame God or point the finger or what are you doing, why are you doing this or or we can really understand God's ways in this. The truth is, if kindness has not led us to repentance, it only leaves God one option. Shaking. So it's just the way of things. All right, so Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. And the man gave names to the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper a helper suitable for him. In that simple little phrase is bound up the eternal purpose of God with his bride. A helper suitable for him. It is key that we understand that that phrase alone, in and of itself, will bring us straight to eternal purpose. It is not an internal need of God that we're dealing with. It is an eternal, external purpose. To move the creation that he's created from a created creator relationship to an internal spiritual relationship. I'm going to say that again. It is to move what he has created, the vastness of his creation. Universe is filled with beings. Just let that sink in for a second. To move them from a creator, creator, created relationship to an internal relationship. You cannot create internal relationship. It must be grown. The bride, eternally so, was to be the perfect vessel for that the suitable helper for God. So I want us to see that right from the start. Because we think, you know, it's all over when we leave this earth and we float around and play harps in heaven. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
There's an eternal ministry with the bride. That ministry is very specific. It is dealing with royalty. It is dealing with a priesthood. And it's dealing with the prophetic. And I mean by the prophetic, the voice of God through his bride to all of creation. It is an eternal priestly ministry. It is the giving of the lamb to the entirety of the creation. So we're at the beginning of the beginning, first the miniature, next the magnitude in the coming age. So amen. That's a little bit exciting. You might get a pinky twinch or something out of that one, you know. <laughs> Let's go on, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept. This is the imagery of the death of Christ bringing forth the bride. This is real, but it's also imagery. Both are true. It's, it's real, but it's a picture. It's a type. Then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she, has, she was taken out of man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father. That's exactly why the Lord Jesus left the father, to bring forth his bride. That was the eternal plan of the father, of the Godhead. The son must come out to establish the bride. For this cause... A man shall leave his father, his mother, shall cling to his wife. They shall become one. It is in the coming out of the Lord Jesus from the Father that he is able to establish and bring his bride, his wife. That's just Revelation 21 imagery, Revelation 20 and 21 imagery there. When you read it, uh, come let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he shows them the city of Jerusalem, the new city of Jerusalem, which is a picture of the bride. If you read that verse with that understanding, those verses with that understanding, you'll see the elements of the beauty of the bride in that passage. Her transparency is in that passage. All those things of how God has, has the work God has done and that she has made herself ready, chapter 19, is shown to us in chapter 21. The bride made ready is in chapter 21, is it's pictured as a city. Is she a city? Yes, she is. But is there also a city? Yes, there is. Which is a wedding gift of the lamb to his bride. A city, 1,500 miles high. Can actually be seen coming in from space. So, unless I get off on all of that, um, both are true. She is a city, and a city is given to her. <clears throat> She's presented with that as a wedding gift. All right, so verse 24 For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And then I want us to look at uh, the Gospel of John for just a second. <clears throat> and just correlate these passages together for a moment. If you were to read chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, and we don't have time to read all of that, we're going to, verse 1, we're going to read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is... That is Genesis 1-1 in the beginning. What we're seeing here in John's Gospel is the new creation. In Genesis, we're seeing a natural creation. In the Gospel of John, we're seeing the new creation. That's why these books begin that way. The Holy Spirit wanted us to see that the natural creation was made in order for the eternal spiritual creation the new creation, a bride, to be brought forth. So as we're, just as in Genesis, you read in the beginning, and it'll come straight to Adam and his bride. So you'll see the same thing here in the Gospel of John. You see the new creation, chapter 1, and then we see, by the time we get to chapter 3, John and his comments here in chapter 3, 
verse 27, where John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Listen to verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. John brings into play, the Spirit of God does, just like in Genesis, this issue of a new creation now and what was typed in Genesis but comes to spiritual reality now in an ongoing way. The bride and the bridegroom purpose. The bride and the bridegroom purpose. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, and that's what John says he is. He's a friend of the bridegroom. He does, listen, to be a friend of the bridegroom means you don't get in the way of the bridegroom and the bride. You don't get between them. To be a friend of the bridegroom is to ensure that the glory is unto the bridegroom and his bride. So he says, I'm, I'm but a friend of the bridegroom, that's what he calls himself, who stands and hears him and rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. And so this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase. I must decrease. So as John recognizes, that's twofold, really. It is the Old Testament pointing to a fulfillment beyond itself, to another covenant of which it typed and shadowed. And it is the last prophetic ministry of that former covenant. John represents that. So that John is there to say this, literally. All the prophets and prophetesses who had prophesied in type and shadow or directly by voice, the coming of the one, the Messiah, all that prophetic history comes to a single individual, John the Baptist. He stands there with a direct commission of God. The one whom you see the Spirit descend upon, he is the one. John, and that, and I tell you what, is perhaps the greatest prophetic ministry. We want to just say it that way points his finger and says, this is the one of whom all the prophets spoke. What a place to stand in history, huh? But recognizing that that culminated or terminated his ministry. <clears throat> so, what we see here then in John chapter 3 is what we're seeing in Genesis we see God bringing us to the eternal issue. It's important that we see this, very important. I can't express how important it is, and I'll talk more about this in a second, that we see eternal issues. If we're going to have the burden of the Lord given to us, individually and as a people, and I, I'm trying to move our thinking beyond the individual because we're way too much individualistic in this nation. Wouldn't you agree? To a, God's after something corporate. He's always been after something corporate, and that something happens to be a bride. He's after something that, uh, how many will say with me, we've struggled with. We can't get along, can we? And it's not just that we can't get along. We're in great battle, and we have to recognize that. The people of God are in great battle, not only in our relationship with the Lord, but in our relationships with one another. The enemy is working to keep a people from coming out of this mess and unto the Lord. Because the bride, you read it in Genesis, is one who comes out. And the prophetic history of this, starting all the way back with Abraham, is of a people who come out. They're called out. Satan is resisting us greatly in this. He has forever resisted us in this. That God would not have a people who come out. Out of what? Out of themselves. Particularly. That's the internal. But out of everything that has set itself up against the knowledge of God in Christ. Have come out 
to him, not just out of things. The issue is not just the coming out of things. The issue is the coming unto him. That's the issue. The coming out of things is just a direct result of coming unto him. So I don't want to get caught up on the, well, we've come out of this and we've come out of that. That's not the real question. Ultimately, it's not what we've come out of. The question is, who have we come to? The bride paradigm is a coming unto. It's about wedding. It's about union. It's about being joined. It's about becoming one with. Amen? So, so we have to see that. Um, and uh, again, I don't have a lot of time to spend on these passages. But I want us to, to, I've said this before, but let me say it again. I want us to see thus there's something better than, and don't stone me when I say this or do stone me. I don't care. I'm ready to go. There's something bigger than and better than redemptive love. And the church has become trapped in redemptive love. It is almost its entire message. But brothers and sisters, there was a love that had a, that had a breadth and a length and a width and a depth eternally that is vastly greater than redemptive love. It is bridal love. And the church almost knows nothing about it. We have made salvation the end in and of itself. And we have missed the eternal purpose of God. Redemptive love is but the way back to the eternal purpose of a bridal love. As great, and I don't, miss, I don't, I don't want to understate something here to us, as great and beyond us, as redemptive love is and can be, the, the Lord is calling us into deeper waters of bridal love that is eternal and not contained within time like redemptive love is. It is contained within time. Has a very clear beginning, will have a very clear end. Not true of bridal love. So we have to get into the eternal, wade out into the deep. Do we not, brothers and sisters? How many say with me, let's go for it. Let's come to know what we should have already known. But we've been playing with pebbles on the beach instead of getting out into the deep. And it's time, the Lord is saying this to his people, it's time to come. Come out. Come out to me in this. Let me, this is Ephesians 3, I've quoted it basically, but this is the whole purpose of Paul's writing Ephesians 3, is to demonstrate a love beyond redemptive love. What is the breadth and the length, the width, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses understanding. Listen, here's the contingency. That you may be filled to all the fullness. We will never come to that fullness of purpose and intent in simply enjoying redemption and its love. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I'm not trying to downgrade it. I'm trying to say something to our hearts, though. The purpose is greater than that. It is to become what he eternally wanted, why he made humanity to begin with, was to have a bride. That's the purpose of humanity, to become that bride. To reign with him, with the Lamb, from this earth. And through that bride, to cover all of creation, with the knowledge of the Lamb. It is an eternal ministry. will never cease. Eternal ministry of the Lamb. Because of her royalty. It is an Esther dynamic. It is the giving away of a nature. A royal nature. The sharing of that nature. It is a priestly ministry of giving the Lamb himself to what's created, including the angelic order, but not limited to that. Very little is actually said about the angelic order in Paul's writings in Ephesians 3. That through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to heavenly rulers and authorities. It's not talking about angels there. The angels are included, but that's not the full scope of it. You know what is the truth, brothers and sisters? We've been so landlocked to this earth, we've missed God's purpose. We've missed something that's eternal. And thank God for this time. This is the time. Want to know what this time is and where the burden of God lies? This time, starting with the beginning, what I've read in John, the beginning of the ministry of the Lord was to bring in the scope of the bride. Revelation ends with that in the last chapter. The spirit and the bride say come. You'll see there between those two passages, you will see this age in view and you will, we will discover that the purpose of this age is the bride to make herself ready to emerge, to come forth. Now whatever burden of God we're carrying is going to have to have that attached to it. In fact, it needs to be the main issue. God has been after a bride for his son. He said it that way, for the lamb. The father to have a family and the spirit to have a temple. It's one entity called the bride. Amen. So this is the time I'm talking about in this time frame from John chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. This time frame of beginning the Alpha and the Omega of the bride making herself ready. And when the bride has made, and I had to say this because this, people are saying this around me all the time, well, God needs to do something. He already has. It ain't a matter of God needing to do something. It's a matter of a bride making herself ready. And what does that mean, Terry? She's making herself ready for him. Not for things, for him. That's the issue of marriage. She has made herself ready for their union for their oneness. His will has become her will. His purpose has become her purpose. His desire has become her desire. They are one, united. Amen? That's beautiful, isn't it? This picture of marriage. What marriage should be, though. Not what marriage has become because of fallenness. But in Christ, marriage needs redemption. It needs to move back into the purpose for which God called it to be. Would you agree with that, brothers and sisters? So we're in a huge battle. We've been in a huge battle. We continue to be in a huge battle. And the battle is not just that I'm being resisted in one area. We need to see where we're being resisted. We're being resisted on a bridal paradigm. We're being resisted in love. We're being re resisted in unity. Satan knows, he can read too, that the bride making herself ready spells his doom. He is resisting it with everything that's within him. It's forever been the case. But that demands a choice beyond just redemption. I've been talking about this, I know, and um, <clears throat> it goes down like a rat sandwich. But there's a choice in this beyond redemption. There's a choice to come out of self-centered living that we can still live though we're saved. It's a choice to come out of a Matthew 25 syndrome that you have ten virgins there. All of them are redeemed. But only five hear the voice of the bridegroom and have come out because they're ready. That is what we're dealing with here, folks. Only What's the distinction there, Terry? Five are ready, five are not. Amen. And the door to the marriage supper is open and only five go in. So that Revelation 19 comes into perfect play. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So what are you trying to say to us? I'm trying to challenge us. We have become neck deep in religion. Neck deep in our own stuff. Our own ministries. Our own this. Our self-centered living. God is saying to his people, come out to me. Come out. 
He's using adversity now to do it. Come out. I'm trying not to be too intense. Is this too intense? I know I get intense at times. So. Um, good. I'll be more intense. So. <laughs> so I'll lighten it up for a second here before the hammer stroke falls. <laughs> So, we begin to see then in that purpose that God has is his burden. Singularly. God's burden revolves around his purpose. To have a bride. To have a people who have come out to him. She has made herself ready to be his forever. He does it for her. I said this before. I heard the Lord say this to me. He said, with the great deception that is about to come upon this earth, the bride can't be deceived. Because when you only want him, what can you offer her? <laughs> well, where does it say that, Terry? Song of Songs. Let's just read a little bit of that. Because that whole book is what we're talking about here this morning. So we'll read just a few choice passages from the Song of Songs. Uh, Song of Songs, I'll just read through them quickly. Song of Songs chapter 2, verse number 4. He's brought me to his banquet hall, to the house of wine, is the way that should be translated out of the Hebrew. He's brought me to the house of wine, and his banner over me is love. Uh, Song of Songs chapter 2, verse 16. My beloved is mine. Listen to this language. This is the bridal paradigm. My beloved is mine, and I am his. I love that, don't you? That's said about three times in this book. <clears throat> Chapter 4, verse number 12. Here's the bridal paradigm. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. She is singularly the Lord's. She does not have many lovers. She has one. That is the issue. Isn't that right, Laura? We know this within our hearts, folks. There it, here's the truth of it. The invitation of God is to all. That is true. But it demands dedication. It demands consecration. It demands sanctification. Would you agree? And we have a welfare mentality in the church now that says, I get it because you owe it to me. That's what's come up. We do not understand the invitation of God demands consecration, demands dedication, demands commitment, demands a choice of us. Yes, the invitation is to all. But I'm, I'm going to say this, and I hate to say this, but only a remnant's going to respond. If I've ever been shown anything clearly by the Lord, I've seen that issue. There will only be a remnant. That is not the heart of God. Certainly isn't my heart or your heart. But it's what's going to happen. No, the testimony of the bride is, I'm his locked garden. I'm his sealed spring. I am his. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, one other, we'll just turn to the end of the, the book here in chapter 8. Verse 6, put a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. It flashes, its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Listen to this, many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man, here's what I said earlier, if a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. <laughs> That's where the bride lives. You can't offer her things. She just wants him. That removes deception. What am I pushing for? I'm pushing us to a choice. That's what I'm pushing for. It's what the Lord's commanded me to do. 
Do we want to be a people who have come out to him? Not just come out. Come out to him, for him, unto him, to be his. I am his, he is mine. What a testimony. It's a beautiful testimony, isn't it? So, I'll move along here. I'm doing pretty good. I've still got 30 minutes. Is that right? Something like that? <laughs> Long way to go, but I've got 30 minutes to go in it. So, let's read a few other passages here. Let's read uh, Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just mention this. In chapter 2 and 3, we'll see something very specific dealing with the seven churches. And that is, at the end of those, uh, each word that the Lord is actually sharing with those congregations of people that are represented there, there is a promise. That promise is to him that overcomes. We will find this to be true in the scriptures. The promises will come straight to the overcomer. And I'm not going to read all of those promises. I'm just going to read two of them to us this morning out of Revelation chapter 3. But I want us to keep that in mind. The bride is an overcomer. In this book of Revelation, by the way, I, I, I have a little issue with the book of Revelation because of what it's been called. The book of Revelation should have been called the Revelation of the Lamb. I, I talk about this from time to time. The word lamb appears in that book actually 28 times if you count them. If you take the rest of the New Testament and look up the word lamb and how often the word lamb, just the word, and one of the references is not specific concerning the Lord himself, You'll find it four times in the rest of the New Testament. The book of Revelation is the book of the revelation of the Lamb and simultaneously of his bride. That issue is the heart of the book of Revelation. The bride is in, think about this, the bride is in perfect union of one life with the Lamb. She is the bride of the Lamb. They are one. I've seen it in spiritual experience by moving into the future and seeing the Lamb reigning from this planet. And the Lamb and His bride, I saw them singularly upon the throne. I could see no distinction. They are one. She is his bride. She is his wife. And as the Lord told me, in the coming age, will be the mother. But that's to the rest of creation. That's why we're in the Milky Way galaxy, by the way. You think I'm kidding about that? I'm not. It's divine symbolism. The mother must give milk. To the rest of the creation, the milk of the lamb. None of this stuff is accidental with the Lord, folks. None of it. He is way too specific for that. Okay, so Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 12 He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write upon him, listen to this promise to the overcomer, which is the bride. We'll see that in the book of Revelation. I will write upon him the name of my God. That's a possessive act. This one is mine. I am his. Singularly. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. That is the bride. You can read it in Revelation chapter 20 what he's talking about here. This is the bride which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name, new to us, not new in eternity. That name is the Lamb. All that is written, that's the promise, upon the overcomer. And then verse 21, he who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. I just want to say something to you. There's this uh, heretical teaching that all the church is going to sit on the throne with him. Only the bride is. 
I knew that would go like a shockwave through the <laughs> That's exactly what this verse is saying. You cannot argue with it. You say, well, man, I'll just be glad to be there, Terry. I've, I've, I've been in heaven a number of times. I've seen men and women of God. I could name some of them to you. I won't do that. What was called the realm of the least. What Jesus refers to, you should be least there. It's Christ who first introduces that understanding. If you're first here, you'll be last there. And I listened to them as they came, walked up to me, approached me. I listened to them tell me, I've, I've shared this before, tell me with regret. You say, well, there's no regret in heaven. I'd beg to differ. He'll wipe every tear from their eye, but I'm telling you there's regret. And here's the regret. That we did not come into the full purpose of the Lord. That we can, listen, we can only make the choice of that here and now. There is too late. Let that hit our hearts. I cannot overemphasize that fact. If we are going to be the bride, the choice can only be made here and now. There is no other place. It will not be in the heavens where it's made. It's made here. We are here to make that choice or not. Sobering, isn't it? It is sobering. I watched uh, the realm of the least had an, an inordinate amount of ministers in it. Because they said, Give, here's what I was told. Because it's what the Lord told me. And someone who walked right up to me. Because they had uh, given up their high calling to be with him for supposedly high calling here on earth in ministry. Brothers and sisters, it is easy to do. Our first call is to be his bride, to be with him. And unless that becomes first, what is meant to be the result of that choice will never be. So, verse 21, I'll just finish it. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So, we understand then the purpose of the bride eternally was a helpmate. Again, we have to define that. That's not that God has a need. God has a purpose. And that purpose entails the perfect vessel, requires the perfect vessel. The perfect vessel must choose to come out to him, to which he can inwardly transform the created thing. He can, he, and he did. He can make all of that in six days. But it can't be made mature in six days. And they're waiting for us there. They have been promised our coming. And we're man be pamping around here, <laughs> acting like this is it. And one day I'm going to graduate and I'm going to be playing the harp up there for a billion, billion, trillion years, never understanding the eternal purpose of the Godhead to have a perfect vessel, perfect vessel of love, which, which, with which and through which to transform the created universe. I'm talking about the beings of it from within. That's the purpose. It has forever been the purpose. Quiet, isn't it? <laughs> so, let's look at a few more passages of Revelation and then I'll, I'll close. Revelation chapter 19, I talked about it, might as well read it. Verse 7 of Revelation 19, Let us rejoice 
and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. If you back up, and there's no, I say this all the time, no chapters in the original, So, but if you back up into chapter 17 and 18, we will see something that is particularly important for us to see. The bride made ready is in the context of adversity. It's what I was talking about this morning. It is her coming out of a Babylonian spirit, and we have to define the Babylonian spirit because it's not just an economic thing. It has economics tied to it. Babylon is a religious system. I know that historically because I said this last time I shared, but I have to share it again. There's a lot of you who were not here. At the heart of the ancient city of Babylon stood a temple in the center of that city. That temple was the Tower of Babel. That is historically accurate. It was into that temple that Nebuchadnezzar, you can read about this in Daniel, in Ezekiel, when he captured, listen to this, the royal family of Israel and made them his servants so that, get this, the name of Nebuchadnezzar's gods were superior to the name of Jehovah. That's what's going on. And he took all the things of the house of God and carried them away and put them in the temple of his God, the Tower of Babel in Babylon. Tell me that's not happening in the church now. What's that mean, Terry? It means this. Babel means this. Babylon. It meant make a name for yourself. It means confusion, literally, in the word. But the spirit behind the Tower of Babel was make a name for yourself. Tell me that's not in the church. Tell me it's not in the ministry. Tell me that's not what we've got to come out of. That's why Revelation 17 and 18 are so key. Come out of her, my people. Talking about Babylon. It is this coming out, the bride coming out of Babylonian spirit. Make a name for yourself unto the name of people called by his name. We so blow through those scriptures. And we generalize them. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray. That's not general, that's specific. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. That's specific, folks. The Lord's call to the Apostle Paul, you will bear my name to the nations. We'll go on and on with this. You've been baptized. I've been baptized into the name. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse number 10. I will be with you in my name, and the nations will tremble. We've gotten away from that, from being a peculiar people because of whose we are. That's the bridal paradigm. She gives up her name by taking his. You know what is the truth? We want to take his without giving up our own. And we want to make a name for ourselves. I told you I was going to let the hammer stroke fall. But that's not the solution. My, I'm, I'm hitting the solution. What's the solution, Terry? I've been told this directly by the Lord. I'm, in, I'm bringing my people into a time of recovery of my name. I'm going to recover. It's going to be a remnant. I want to be a part of it. How about you? Brothers and sisters, it is a good thing to be discontent. It really is. If you're discontented, it can be good. But be careful. There is beauty in being discontented, and there is ugliness in being a malcontent. To be discontented can be the Lord. To become a malcontent is always the enemy in the flesh. The distinction being the malcontent knows how to complain but doesn't do anything to remedy the situation. I know no one in this room's ever done that, but we're all pure as the driven snow. <laughs> I'm going to caution us. This is not a day to be a malcontent. 
Nehemiah was discontented. But here was the here is the spirit of the Lord within him after he goes out at night and inspects those walls and sees their true condition. Everything's broken down. Nothing is as God determined it to be. You have to understand that wording. When we look at it, we say nothing is as God wanted it to be. There's a good discontentedness in that. That's good. Amen. To keep it from becoming a malcontent, here's what must rise up in us by the spirit of the Lord. Let's rise up and build. That's the distinction. I like you. I'm not any more happy than anyone in this room is with the state of things. But the Spirit of the Lord within us must say, let's rise up, let's build. And I'm not talking about building things. I'm talking about His house. The house that we are. God is a solution-oriented God, is He not? His movements, His recovery is the solution. He is going to have a people. It begins with his burden. They know his burden. They carry his eternal purpose within them. God aimed, he set his, his own thought and purpose upon this. Here's the bride. We are going to become that. We're going to give ourselves to him. We're going to align our hearts with him in this. We will unite with him in the oneness of, of his being, of his person, of his life, of his love. In, internally, we will be one with him in this. Break down every resistance within me, every barrier within me, every form of religion. Say, well, you don't know what I've been through through the church. You don't know what I've been through through the church either. This, ain't not, this is not about what we've been through. Something bigger has to get a hold of us than that. Listen, we could have a revolution. Isn't that right, Larry? We could have a revolution in this house if you want it. We could have it in our marriages. But we're going to have to want it. Amen? As the marriage has gone, so has gone the church. Look at the, look at the similarities of it. Because there's not a better picture in the Scripture of God's eternal purpose than marriage. What it was meant to be, though, before it fell under the curse. And you know what the curse is, don't you, ladies? That your husband rule over you. That's the curse. Which is what continues to get preached in the church. Just thought I'd mention that. I know that went down like a rat sandwich. I saw it go through the congregation. <laughs> no, listen. I better say this or I'll get into trouble. No, no. Here's the eternal purpose, that the two are one, and both submit to the Lord singularly. Firstly, that was the eternal purpose. Until the Lord becomes the center of our marriage, we will never have marriage on his ground. We cannot be first, husband or wife. He must be. That's marriage as he intended. Go back and read it. The curse was one ruling the other. That's a curse. It's a cursed relationship. And the church continues to preach it. Continues to perform it in the ceremonies. We just need a good butt kicking somewhere down the line here. Just telling you, we need it. Don't we? All right, so I'm going to close. I really am. I'm almost there. Hang on. You'll see Terry close. First time ever. <laughs> so we see that the bride... Making herself ready, here's what I wanted us to see, is in the context of battle, adversity, warfare. Unity is a coming to the body of Christ without massive battle. 